What if it's 1975 and you gotta come up with a couple bucks to put yourself through college? Dave had bought this Boss 302 a couple years earlier and his only hope of going to school was to sell it. He sold it for $2,300, but he was smart enough to put a first right of refusal on it and he kept track of it all those years. Now the next owner actually kept it until Dave bought it back. Imagine that, it had become part of his family and no amount of money was gonna pry it loose. But you know what pried it loose? Was the fact that Ford brought back the Boss 302 in 2012. Not only did they bring back a standard Boss 302, but they brought in the Laguna Seca, a limited edition hot rod. Well, this is what it took for Dave to get back his high school sweetheart, a brand new Laguna Seca straight trade. Now, would you do that today? We've already got this car stripped down to the bare shell and there's a few things I wanna show you. Anytime we pull a car apart around here, I'm always scraping looking for the numbers, the serial numbers in the dash, the serial numbers in the engine bay aprons. You wanna make sure the car is what it's supposed to be. Well, the way you know you have a real Boss 302 is the G is the fifth digit in the serial number here on the dash, as well as here in the engine bay apron. You also know it's a real Boss 302 because of the wraparound shock towers in the front and the staggered shock braces in the rear. Paperwork's so important and often build sheets are left in the cars under the carpets. What was interesting is we found two build sheets in this car. The first one you can see where the masking tape was still on it. This would have been hung on the hood as the car went down the assembly line so the guys could read it. Once it's finished, they rip it off, they throw it under the, under the carpets. The second build sheet here, same as the first, you can see the rotation number, the 735. You can see that it's a Mustang Boss 302, but more importantly, it gives us a bunch of information. You always see those colorful chalk marks and those markings on springs and shocks and all that. Well, this tells us that the front shock on this car was white. It tells us the rear shock on this car was orange. It tells us that the uh, drive shaft would have had a blue, blue and lavender stripe on it. All that comes from the build sheet. So when we're restoring this car, we know that we put the right color codes back on the pieces kind of interest. People always talk about matching numbers. What it is for a lot of cars is the serial number or a portion of the serial number is stamped in the engine as well as the transmission. Well, the serial number of the car is on the transmission case, but it's on the top flange here, so the training pretty much has to be out of the car. It's buried in the tunnel. Once you clean off all the grease, the numbers become evident. The serial number on the engine of a Boss 302 is on the back of the block behind the intake manifold on this machine surface. So you can gently scrape it away and the numbers become evident. You can see the 6145. Well, when any restoration project comes back from the sandblaster, there are no more secrets. Just have a look at this car. You can see obviously where there's some rust here. You can see it's starting to rust here. You can see where this is remnants of an accident. The car was actually hit. The car is severely rusty in some spots, but the bones are still saveable. The shock towers are still intact. The rear frame rails are still intact. It's gonna require a lot of sheet metal work, but everything is there. But before we start any of that, I'll tell you what we wanna do is we wanna prime it. People always ask me, why are you priming the car when it comes back from the sandblaster or from the, the uh, chemical stripper or if you just strip it by hand? Why do you prime it right away? Why don't you do your body work or your metal work? And I'll explain why. The real reason is the second you get that car into bare metal, it's open to the elements. It's open to the grease on your hands. It's open to solvents in the air. It's open to oils. It's open to anything. And it's very porous. Metal without a primer over top is porous. So you can see here on this panel, this replacement panel, you can actually see where somebody grabbed it like that. And they got their palm print here. You can see where the fingerprints are here. Problem is, is it doesn't show up right away. It might show up a year later then it's too late, the car is already painted. So what we do, the second we get a car back from the sandblaster, we vacuum it all out, blow it all out, get as much of the sand out as we can. Then we roll off wheel any of the surfaces that need to be done or sand them. Then what we do is we put it into primer to protect it before we begin any metal work. That way we can touch it, we can work on it, we're not worried about contaminating the raw metal. Now the second thing we do is a lot of the sheet metal parts, you can't sandblast. If you blast this, it's gonna destroy it, it's gonna warp it. You can see on the car here, what we've done is we've done all the door jams and everything, but we haven't done any of the big panels. We're gonna strip these by hand. 
Panels that are removable, we send out to get acid dipped. They get washed and rinsed two or three times over. Again, we'll DA them, we'll use the Rolock wheel, then we'll put them in primer before we do any work. You can see here, this car had hood pins at one point. So what we did is we sanded away all the primer so we get down to the bare steel. We did a plug weld right here where the hood pins used to be. And now what we'll do is we'll prep it quickly again, put it back into primer. Everything needs to stay into epoxy primer while you're doing the body work, while you're doing the metal work, it really doesn't matter. And if you're gonna be real anal about it, what you wanna do is you wanna do all your body work on top of the epoxy primer, and then you wanna sandwich it in. Once all your body work's done, you wanna put another coat of epoxy primer on before you use any sort of polyester or high build fillers. Doing it this way may cost you more money in materials, may cost you more money in man hours, but it's like building a house. The foundation has to be right. You can do anything over top of this paint-wise and it's gonna last forever. So after we get the body back from the sandblaster, it's on a dolly. Now we gotta move it from the dolly to the surface plate. And the reason you have a surface plate is, is a number of reasons actually. One is you have a flat, surface to measure from which is called your datum line and a lot of guys in the collision business will understand what the datum line is, is where you take all your measurements from if you're doing this on a garage floor and you've just got jack stands or you're just propping it up on something and you start cutting out pieces the car is going to move the car is going to twist the car is going to flex and you can never make an accurate measurement concrete is not flat it slopes in garages second thing we're going to do is we're going to actually mount the car on its original suspension pickup points so where the front A-arm would mount to, where the front of the leaf spring would mount to, and where the rear of the leaf spring would mount to. So now it's as if it were sitting on the ground. Those are the suspension pickup points. So the next thing we wanna do is raise the car up in the air so we can actually work on it. In this case, we've raised it about two feet above its ride height. And there's no reason for that, and it really doesn't matter as far as our measurements go, as long as we add two feet to everything to the original specs. What we've got here is the original spec sheet, and what we can do is make our measurements from the frame rail down to the datum line, from the front pickup point down to the datum line, from the rear point to the datum line, and we can make sure that the car is within spec. This car was out a quarter inch, and considering the car had taken a pretty good hit in its day, it's pretty close. It's not gonna take much to get it back. We're also gonna triangulate here and make sure that the car is not diamond, that it's square. The nice thing is, is once you've got it mounted on the surface plate, you can make all those measurements accurately. The second thing we're gonna do is you're gonna see in the middle here, we've got a center line on the surface plate, we've actually center lined the car. So now we can take just about anything off, measure from the center line and make sure that we've got the panels on square. The idea of taking a car to a proper restoration shop for this sort of extensive work is important. I'd go to that shop, make sure that they have a surface plate or a frame machine. A frame machine will be act like a surface plate as well. Those are two important key things. If you're gonna spend all the money, have somebody do it, make sure they do it right. Marnie, are you sure you don't want a demonstration? Nope, I don't know. It's a doing. power hammer. It's called a power hammer for a reason. I know it's called a power hammer. I'm not a fool. You want to just hit the on button? Okay. This is my first day in the shop. I got my own shirt. Gently, Alrighty. gently on okay, the pedal and hold on tight. I'm holding. It's not built for seriously, a woman. Seriously, seriously, hold on tight. I am holding on tight, Pete. Okay, God. power hammer action and just don't say so myself. I told you it'd be a little bit of vibration, didn't yep. it? Yep, yeah, a little bit of vibration. It's not like I've never felt that before. You go put that in a car now. <laughs> My work here is done. Well, Wes has been hard at work on the Boss 302, and before you can replace a lot of the big panels, I mean, you have engine bay aprons. In this case, we have the cowl section. We have the floor sections to be replaced. Quite often, you remove the big areas, and there's rust to be dealt with on the little areas. The guys from Golden Leaf supplied us with all the body panels for the Boss 302 project. 
tunnel on a Boss 302 is a little different than the original floor pan. And these, they're generic from 65 right up to 70. The ribbing is a little different, so we're actually making some original style ribbing, welding it back in. And that's what we're talking about today, is small repairs. Quite often, you want to do the small repairs first before you can replace the panel. Case in point, with this trunk pan, getting ready to be put in, we've got an original frame rail, and we want to save as much of the original car as possible. So what Wes has done, he's actually cut out a few of these sections here, he's made patch panels for here and welded them in. What's well, after these little repairs have been done that we're ready to put in the big panel. These go relatively quick. These repairs take a little bit of time. Now we've used a zinc rich primer here, which will act like a galvanizer, but it's also weldable. So we put the panel on, ready for the spot welding, panel's finished. A lot of panel replacement is quick and easy. The little bits and pieces are the tedious parts. Since they're mirror images, we'll make two repair panels at once. Using 16 gauge steel, we'll drill all the pilot holes in one go. We start with a pilot hole and we progress to a hole that's three quarters of an inch. We'll place the plates over the rusted area and mark the area we're gonna cut out. We'll drill out all the spot welds first and then we'll use a cutoff wheel to cut out the damaged area. Next, the panel will be fitted for the final time. We'll use a zinc primer on both surfaces. This will help prevent future rust. The zinc primer is also weldable. We'll clamp the repair panel in place first, and then we'll tack weld it. We can then clean out the primer for the plug welds and then we'll solid weld around the outside edge of the panel. After a quick grinding, the original frame rail has been saved and it looks like brand new. As you can see, the repair is invisible. Well, when it comes to putting together a production car, the most used welder is actually a spot welder. Back in the days when Shelby were building the Cobras and Ferrari were building one-off cars, the process was you'd make a panel in pieces and then you'd weld it together. Back then they'd use a torch and they'd use filler rod. Today we have three basic options when we're putting together a car like this Boss. Now since 99% of the panels were spot welded together, it only makes sense if you're doing the restoration to have a great spot welder, yet very few shops have it or invest in it. Now if you're doing the work at home, the most likely welder you're gonna have is a MIG welder. Now the benefit of the MIG welder is it's relatively easy to use, it's relatively cheap, but there's some downside to it as well. It's great for bigger pieces like the shock tower here or the torque boxes. You can do any sort of MIGging there and you're not gonna get much distortion. But if you're gonna do a panel or a repair in the middle of the door or quarter panel and it's maybe 20 gauge steel as opposed to you know some 14 gauge steel, you're gonna wanna use a TIG. And the TIG is gonna reduce the heat or at least you can control the heat. You can control how much rod you're gonna fill in. The last thing too that you have to be concerned with is if you're gonna grind a repair and try and make it invisible is the heat generated by the grinding disc. The MIG's going to leave a little bit more material so you're going to have to be more aggressive with a grinding disc and there's a chance that you're going to distort it that way. The TIG it leaves a little bit flatter weld and it's also easier to crush the weld if you're going to hammer and dolly it. 
With any sort of butt welding, it really doesn't matter whether you're using a TIG MIG or torch, you want to tack the piece in place and make sure the tack is about every inch. This will hold the two pieces of metal as close to each other as possible without any distortion. The better the fit here, the less filler rod that will be required. Now we can solid weld the area between the tacks and not worry about the two pieces of metal moving away from each other. You can see how little filler rod is used with a TIG. The nice thing about the TIG torch is it's also adjustable on the fly. You can adjust the heat while you're welding. You can't do that with the MIG or the acetylene torch. Once you've finished the welding process, you can grind it and make the repair invisible. Now Marnie thinks she's ready to do some welding. She says spot welding in specifically. It's the easiest form of welding to do, but let's give her a test first. It's the easiest, so we'll start Marnie on the easiest. Pull the trigger and hold it. I'm gonna pull the trigger. Pull the trigger and hold it, baby. Bam! Ooh. Oh! Woo! <gasps> Whoa! You look like you're terrified. <laughs> I feel fine. You make fine. me nervous. Baby. I think you got enough now. All right, let's see if I actually achieve my goal. And look at that, a successful weld. Well, one of the typical areas that requires body work on it, just about any restoration is where the quarter panel meets the roof along the sail panel here. And from the factory, they're actually overlapped and then just spot welded. Now we'll weld them solid, and then what we'll do is we'll actually use Metalux, which is an aluminum-based metal filler, and it's a little harder. And we'll do the first couple of coats with the Metalux, and then rough it out like that, and then we'll use a regular polyester body filler. Now the factory would have done this originally with a lead seam, the problem with lead these days is one, it's difficult to work with and if you don't get all the acid out it comes back to haunt you. Great original cars, you'll always see in here how the lead has sunk and moved and shifted. It used to be thought that lead was the way to go. Today's body fillers are just as good. Now the steps to doing this, it's fairly time consuming and you can see how long it takes to get this area nice. After the Metalux has been applied and sanded down, we can start with the polyester body filler applied the same way with the spreader. After that we begin to rough out the bodywork using 80 and 120 grit on a board file. Once the board file work is finished we'll use an aluminum block with 180 grit paper on it. We'll go back and add a second coat of body filler. This time we'll start with the board file and 120 grit. And once that's done, we'll go back to the aluminum block using 240 grit to get rid of some of the coarse sand scratches. Again, making sure that all the edges are done properly. We'll spray a guide coat and again keep progressing with finer and finer sandpaper. In between the guide coat, we'll use a blower to make sure there's nothing stuck in any pinhole or scratches. We'll repeat this process two or three times and finish all body work with 280 grit. One of the other benefits of using a polyester body filler is it's very compatible with the high build fillers that you would use today, the polyesters. The polyesters are basically body filler that's sprayable and then you can use the various grits of sandpaper on a board file to make sure the entire body is straight. Then you would go into your high build primers which is the stage we're at now and now we're ready for final wet sand and once we're finished that we're ready for paint. That'll be next week. Paint day is the most exciting day of any restoration. It's when the car really comes to life. The Boss 302 is ready to get painted its original color which is grabber blue. Now we do everything in Glazer at 90 line and the nice thing is they have all the vintage colors which makes our life a lot easier. But if they don't, what we do is we try and find one spot in the car and clean it off. 
just polish it and make sure that the paint matches. We also do that for what we call slop paint underneath. A lot of times you'll see the undercarriage of a Boss 302, it's primer and overspray, it's the red oxide primer. But sometimes you'll see this greeny gray underneath. What that was just slop paint left over that they sprayed the undercarriage with. This was one of those cars. When we cut out a piece of the floor, when we replaced it, you could see that original greeny gray. We've already sprayed that. Now you might ask why when the car went down the assembly line, we bother bagging all this stuff off. It was never like that down the assembly line. It's true, and if we were gonna be really true to how the car was sprayed, we wouldn't have any of this paper in here. It would just be sprayed as a bare shell. The difference is, is they had a brand new car, no, no rust, in any nooks and crannies, no sandblast dust, no dust and dirt. It was super clean. So what we do is we bag everything off, then we go, we spray the exterior of the car, make sure that there's no dust on the exterior of the car, and then we'll go back and spray all the interior areas. That way we've got a nice clean job. Well, he's just about ready to shoot the color, and I'm gonna show you a little trick after he shoots the color to make sure that the paint is perfect. The first thing a painter does is adjust his gun for the pattern in the fan. We start in the windshield frame area and then we can go to the bigger areas like the roof. As you're working down the sail panel, you'll continue down the quarter panel, trying to get a nice even coat of paint on it. Now the first coat you don't want to go too heavy because you'll have issues with solvent popping later or with fish eyes. So you want a nice light coat just to get the paint bonded to the primer. The second, third and fourth coat are always trickier because now you're reaching over a wet car. You have to be extra careful to make sure the hose or your body does not end up in the paint. When shooting the base, we want to make sure that we get nice even coverage, but we also want to make sure that all the edges are covered, all the jams are covered. We want to make sure that the painter will get underneath the rocker panels. That's a pet peeve. You'll see a lot of guys won't bend right over and get underneath the rockers, so sometimes it's really dry. We've got three coats on the boss now, and we think we've got coverage. It looks to the naked eye like we do, but we're gonna go around the entire car with this color-corrected bulb and just make sure that all the edges are covered. Now, I'm gonna give you a little demonstration here. Every car we spray, we do a spray out card with, and you can see it looks like that we've got 100% coverage with our three coats. Then we look in the corner, and you can see that little BASF logo in the corner when we put the light on it. That means we don't have coverage everywhere. We're gonna have to shoot at least one more coat of paint, possibly two. Depending on the color, reds are very transparent. Obviously, all the candy paints are really transparent. You just keep going until you got full coverage. Go around all the edges with this and then you're ready for the clear coat, but not until you've got complete coverage. Well, a big part of any restoration is detailing the engine. Let's face it, when you open up the hood, this is what everybody wants to see. Having the right smog equipment, the right distributor, the right alternator, all the right hoses, plug wires, all the right bits and pieces, what makes an engine bay great. But a bigger part in my mind for a great restoration is the inside of the motor. It has to run and drive like a brand new car. To just build a motor, slap it together, isn't how we do it. We'll send it down to Active, these guys go through it, they balance blueprint it, and they make sure that it's 110%. The first thing the boys at Active Engines are going to do is they're gonna put the block into the machine and they're gonna actually board over 30 in this case. Boss 302s are notorious for having thin walls, so you don't wanna go 60 over on a Boss 302. The next step is the pistons and they want to clearance the wrist pin properly. It's a tight fit, but it has to be free, especially with a full floating piston. The next step is balancing the crank. They'll put the bob weights in place and spin it up. After that, they're gonna either add Mallory or take away some of the material. 
When it comes to the heads, the guys at Active Engines are really precise. They're going to CC every chamber and make sure they're exactly the same. This will also give them a true compression rating. The next is cutting the valve seats. Here we're going with a three angle valve job. Getting back to the block, they're going to line hone the block. They're going to have all the mains in place and torque down, and then they'll run the line hone through it. The next step is to put the crank bearings in, torque down the main caps, and check for clearances again. The guys at Active Engines are all about checking once, checking twice, and making sure it's 100%. The next step in balancing a motor is the connecting rods. Always starting with the big end first or the heavy end. You weigh it and then take off the material. You want them all to be the same weight. Start with the lightest one and take the material off all the rest and make it match. Once the big end or the crank end are all the same weight, we'll go to the piston end or the small end and make sure they are all equal as well. Well, after all the machining is done and they've mocked it up and checked everything, the assembly process is fairly straightforward. Then it comes here, we detail the motor, and now it's ready to be installed. Well, now that it's time to assemble the Boss 302, it comes down to a lot of parts. Now, Tony Brand has been selling Shelby and Cobra parts forever, but he also sells Mustang parts, and basically, they're all the same. Whether it's a Shelby, a Boss 302, 90% of the components are the same. So whether it's a gas tank, exhaust system, wheels, tires, batteries, hoses, clamps, whatever it is, we can get that from Tony, which is nice. Now there are a few things that are correct for this car that somebody like Tony or all of the parts supplier won't sell you. Things like the carburetor. You're gonna have to find an original carburetor with the original part number, list number, and the date code. That's something you're just gonna have to hunt and then restore. Things like the battery. Originally Boss 302s came with a Group 22. You can't get them anymore anywhere. So we'll take one of Tony Brand's batteries, we'll paint the caps green, we'll change it up a little, it'll be as close as possible to the way the car left the factory, but not exact. Now there's a few tricks too when you're doing assembly, buy the right parts, get somebody knowledgeable like Tony that can help you out with that, but secondly when you start installing them, always tape off some of the areas. We're putting the glass in, so the top of the doors we've just painted it. Why not put a couple of strips of masking tape on the edges here, so as you're putting the glass in, if you, if you bump it a little bit, you're not going to chip the paint. We do the same along the rocker panels here. When the doors are open and close a hundred times, you're crawling in and out of the car, you're going to end up scuffing these. You can see how they're worn already. Don't put your sill plates in early. Wait for those is the last thing you want to do. So just a little bit of common sense when you're doing assembly. Take your time, mask off areas, get two or three guys to help you. When you're doing things like fenders, big panels, make sure you have two or three guys Tape off the edges of the door, tape off the edge of the fender. That way if you bump it a little, you're not going to chip paint to send the car back to the spray booth. Pretty much common sense with assembly. Take your time, tape things off, get guys to help you when you need it. As far as the parts go, get guys that are really knowledgeable and understand these cars, that specialize in these cars. They can make your life a lot easier. Well, we're doing the interior today on the Boss 302, and if you can get away with original pieces, you always want to. So any of the trim pieces, the rear quarter panel pieces, the original dash pad, much nicer to have an NOS piece than a reproduction piece. Now, AMK gives all the hardware, and I mean, every piece is labeled in a bag, so you don't have to worry about that. You know, if you've got the original pieces and they're in great condition, use them. One of the other things with any good restoration is looking behind the dash. Before this goes on, it's amazing when we take a car apart that's been supposedly restored, what goes on behind the dash pad. 
No heater boxes that have been restored. The pedals haven't been restored. It's just a, a bird's nest as far as the wiring goes. You want to look behind the dash and you'll see wiring harnesses that are cleaned or replaced. All the heater boxes that have been detailed so they look good. So if you look under the dash, it looks like brand new. All the pedals have been detailed out. And then there's one other item in the interior that always stands out that a lot of people never look at, and that's the chrome plating. Whether it's the dash bezel surround or the armrest bases, these are armrest bases from another car. But here's one of the things that's tricky to do. Nowadays, a lot of the platers don't want to strip the armrest bases or any of the chrome. Here's a little tip that you can use at home to strip it and then you can send it off to the plater and save you some money. You can't sandblast it, you can't sand it because any of those marks will come out in the chrome. So what we do here is, believe it or not, industrial strength toilet bowl cleaner. We have a tub that we just fill up with the toilet bowl cleaner and then we can reuse it. We'll put in this piece that hasn't been stripped yet and you'll just put it in and leave it in there literally for about a week. Close the lid and forget about it. A week later, pull it out. The majority of it will have just dissipated on its own. Use a small brush, a toothbrush or any sort of non-abrasive brush and try and get the loose pieces off. Anything that won't come off easily, you'll have to put it back in for another couple of days. You don't want to scratch that plastic as those scratches will show up in the plating later. So far we've been able to use most of the original pieces with this Boss 302 interior, but when it comes to carpets, headliner, seat covers, and door panels in this case, we're gonna surrender. We're gonna go with good reproduction units that will still score well in an MCA judging system. Well, you remember when Dave Swanson's boss first came in here, how rough it is. The car was rusty, the car was hit. We went through all the metal work, we did all the paint work. We rebuilt the motor, we did the interior. It's a ground up restoration on this car. And then there's the finishing touches. And obviously the big thing on a Boss 302 is the stripe. On a 70, it's got the stripe coming off the hood and down the side. And they're a little tricky to put on. You wanna make sure they're laid out correctly. The top line here is cut on the top of the fender. It's moved down. The bottom line is along the top of the, the body line here. So when you're putting one of these on, have a good look at a nice original car or a great restored car and make sure that you line up the stripes properly. It's a little bit of work and actually for that, sometimes it's worth hiring the right guy to put on the stripe. The kits are expensive, so if you screw one up, you have to buy a second one. It's cheap insurance to hire the right guy to stick it on. Secondly are all the detail, the finicky things, all the chalk marks, all the original paint dabs. Remember originally when we looked at the build sheet of this car, we found the build sheet under the carpets here and we went through it and you could see all the markings. You could see how on the leaf springs it would have two different color markings. That was so the parts guy would go to the bin, pick up the Boss 302 spring and put it in. Same thing with the drive shaft, same with the rear leaf springs, the front coil springs. And then all the things, once they're tightened or, or ready to go, they'd have either the OK or on it or the X on the drain plug. Those are all items that were done along the assembly line to let the next person down the line know that that had already been checked. We go through that, we'll do all those markings as the last sort of detail, final touches on this car and all the cars that get restored to this extent. Well, the last thing we're gonna do is actually shake down the car. And what we're gonna do there is take it for a drive. I just want to take it easy the first couple times around, whether it's on the street or a closed circuit like here, it really doesn't matter. I want to make sure all the gauges are working, the gas gauge is, is working, we need actually a little bit more fuel. Looks like the tack and speedo are fairly accurate. I want to go through and check all the lights and the wipers and make sure all those things are working. And then just really take note of what the car is doing, you know. Is it stumbling as you're getting on the gas? Is there any issues with it popping out of gear? Uh, you want to go through all the gears, listen for any clunks or squeaks or rattles. So we're just going to go through all the gears first. Shifter feels really nice and tight. That's another thing. From the factory, these cars, the shifters weren't the best, but this one's very nicely done. It's nice and tight. Now there's a little bit of a clunk when I'm downshifting and I'm wondering, there's all new U-joints in this car, but we're going to have a look. That'll be on the list. I'm going to have a look and see if that clunk is in the U-joint. The other thing too is with the clutch right now when I push it down, there's a squeak. So I mean it's something that, it's not a big deal, but it could be irritating to the guy if he's going to drive it a fair bit. It definitely goes up and down through the gears nice. It's nice and tight. 
let go of the wheel and it will start doing stuff like braking. Car brakes in a straight line with my hands off the wheel. There's no shake, there's no shutter, it doesn't want to pull. The other thing too is you want to run it for a little bit because sometimes issues can develop. You know, temperature, it's a fairly warm day today, but if you let it idle outside, you know, let it idle for 20 minutes, if the temperature doesn't get too hot there, that's great. That means that if the thing's stuck in traffic, we're probably okay, not gonna overheat the car. The other thing is, is really the car seems very tight and usually we'll spend, like I said, a bunch of time. I don't think this one's gonna require the 40 hours. We're gonna put it back on the hoist, make sure we do a nut and bolt one more time. They're gonna check for the U-joint, see what that little clunk is. They're gonna fix the squeak in the spring there. Um, other than that, we're gonna do one last test and I think we're ready to uh, hand it over to the customer. Uh, basically, the, that boss is the first real car I had. Uh, it was actually my third car, but it, that car was part of the culture of the people we grew up with. Had a whole bunch of friends that had Mustangs, and uh, it just literally was part of our culture growing up. We hung around together, we worked on cars, our parents always knew where we were. We weren't getting in trouble, we were maybe getting in trouble with the police once in a while, but it basically was uh, just part of growing up. My brother was the first owner of the car, and I remember vividly when we went to, to, to look at the car, and I went with him to buy it, and I remember the Grabber Blue just was such a unique color at that time, it was really stunning to see. And uh, at that time, we didn't know what a boss really was. We didn't appreciate what it was like I do now. So my brother owned it about six months, and uh, a little bit later down the road, he ran into a white Boss 302, and he said, oh, you need to buy the white one. And I said, oh, I like that Grabber Blue color a lot. So he ended up selling me the car, and he bought the white one. And then uh, a couple years later, uh, after enjoying the car a lot, uh, I needed some money to go to college, so I sold it to Mike. It started in 1975. A very good friend of mine, David Swanson, um, had the vehicle, and uh, he wound up going away to college. So the car was put up for sale, and uh, I was the lucky guy that purchased it, and uh, 36 years later, um, here we are. So my brother bumps into Mike um, about five years ago, and from that time on, kind of hooked us back together, and I uh, started asking him to sell me the car back. At that time, he really didn't want to. There was, uh, there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of sentimental value in, in the, uh, the thought of selling the vehicle. Uh, you have to understand that uh, I, I've had the car longer than I've had my wife, my children. So that car was a part of my family. So when I, when I spoke with them about selling the vehicle, they were absolutely dead set against it. Well, you gotta remember, I had the car about two years and he had it 36. So he had a lot more memories than I did. Mine were probably more vivid and mine were probably better. But well, when I, when I found out that I had access to a Laguna Seca. Actually, Ford dealer in Chicago, McCarthy Ford, did, uh, I've done a lot of business with them, so they treated me really well on the car. Well, the deal was kind of a gentleman's deal uh, between myself and Dave, uh, but it did involve a Laguna Seca, a brand new 2012 uh, black and red Laguna Seca. And uh, so we worked it out where I just basically called him up and said, you know, I have access to a Laguna Seca. And at that time, I don't think he believed how rare they were and how hard they were to get. And, he, uh, we talked through, you know, maybe I'd be interested, it'd be a way to keep a boss. And he called me back a couple nights later and he said, you know, I called six or seven Ford dealers and they all laughed at me when, you know, they, I wanted a Laguna Seca. And so the fact that you can get one, you know, this is, this is something that I think would be kind of fun to do. And that we made it a lot more appealing to him knowing the car was really that rare and that sought after. I think we both wound up in, uh, we both wound up with cars that we like. Dave, how's it going? Hey, Peter. Good, Good to, to see, see you. you. Like you to meet Mike Brichetto. Hey, Mike. How are you? Nice uh, to meet you. You're the, guy, the that guy that sold me the car. Finally gave it up. Yeah. Huh? 36 years Took ago. Took a little arm twisting. Yep. Yeah. Here we are back at the table again. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, you want to look at Definitely it? Definitely want to see yeah, it. Absolutely. I've been waiting a long time for this. <laughs> Got her? Ah, oh, look at that thing. It's unbelievable. That car is beautiful. I've always loved that color grabber blue. That's unbelievable. The shaker and everything. That's a gorgeous car.
Looks good. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Man. Look at that waste of space, a rev limiter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, was it bone stock when you got it? It was basically bone stock, stock. and then I put headers on it and put a heavy duty clutch and so all you did all that stupid kid stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you got it and I got it and kept modifying it, it for uh, 36 years. I remember vividly that he, uh, he lectured me as he was selling me the car. <laughs> We even have the original receipt here for you guys to take a look at. I kept it after all these years. And uh, how, much, kinda, how much was it for? It was, I think the we total was like twenty three fifty or something like yeah, that. Twenty three hundred bucks. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of money in them days. <laughs> and he didn't have enough. He, it was like two hundred. He owed yeah. me, and I wrote in the receipt. You know, he's got to pay me within a couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you gave him terms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the last time that Dave and I had gone for a ride in a Boss three hundred two together was this one when he was dropping it off at my house. Because I had bought it, I had purchased it from him at age 16, and as we were taking it home, I was not quite sure that I was up to the four speed yet. I knew how to drive a manual transmission, but this had a, it had like a 4,000 pound Schaefer clutch in it. It was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was pretty radical compared to what I was used to driving. Well, if that's the last time, why don't you guys jump in this thing, take it around, oh, that'd be great. and that'd be fun. take it for a drive, and that's your new boss? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yep. Can I take it for a drive? Not help yourself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'd rather have you drive that than this. I bet. Because <laughs> I know the way you drive. <laughs> Try not to put it in a ditch on its first maiden drive. Oh yeah. Wow. <laughs> Feels good. Feels very good. Wow, this thing handles awesome. I forgot how good this thing drove. I used to come home from Blues Golf from the gas station, and uh, on occasion I would bury the speedometer <laughs> lock up the brakes, do a 90 degree turn and turn into my subdivision. <laughs> never uh, never had fear with driving this car. I just remember how easy it was to let them let it loose and light the tires up with the big gear in it. Yeah, this 350 Posse is really a high gear. The shaker's got to be one of the best features I think that Ford ever produced. I just think it's so cool. It's, it's just great. It's a, it's it's a, a phenomenal look. It's only four grand. Now I kind of forget, but the old rev limiter. I think it was 6,500. I think you're right. It was about 6,500. It would start shutting the motor down. Being that this engine's still pretty new, I'm I'm going to about 4,200, 4,400. How does it feel to drive it after awesome. 36 you're, years? You're going to take the next couple laps in it. Oh, that's awesome. I love that sound. Wow. <laughs> Brings back memories. Absolutely. I'm just so glad that, you know, we stayed friends over the years. Oh, and this whole thing has really rekindled a great friendship. And how many, how many guys do you hear story after story? I wish I never would have sold my old car if I could only get my old car back. And here, your old car has been in my parked in my garage for the last 36 yeah. years. It's still amazing that you kept it and that uh, my brother and you bumped into each other. That's just wild how things happen. I forgot how great this motor sounds. It's incredible. The new ones don't a, sound like this. I mean, it was such a high revving motor to start with. You want to take it for a spin? I'd love to. All right. After 36 years, I still haven't forgot. <laughs> it, it feels like, you know, that's, that's the one part about these old cars. And, 
I was kind of holding on to my youth. I think you're kind of trying to find some of your youth here. Yeah, relive a little bit of it. It's just this great. This is unbelievable. Yeah, who, who would think that we'd be doing this? This is unbelievable. Yeah, these are far from Ricardo Buckets. 4200 is about where the cam first started producing yeah. the power. I think the power curve was about 42 to about 882, somewhere right in there. There's a 477 lift on it. It's amazing how tight this is. I mean, the, the new technology is nothing to turn a blind eye to. But the technology for 1970, they had it going on. Ford had a, had a real beast here. For a small block high revving vehicle, it really, really drives well. Yeah, that's amazing. Sounds good with the stock exhaust. It, yeah. Obviously not as throaty as it was with the headers and those uh, Corvair mufflers that, from the turbocharged Corvair. Those things were really, had a nice sound to them. But hanging underneath the car with no tailpipes and everything, you could get that exhaust smell in here. You know, the car handles pretty good too for having bias ply tires on. Yeah. I mean, that's not a radial tire like we have nowadays. Yeah. Now the car, it seems like it's shaking out really good. The engine sounds great. The steering's great. Well, Legendary does a great job. They're top notch company. when you're old, getting in and out of these things. <laughs> Excellent. You guys did a tremendous job on this vehicle. Runs good? Runs great, the steering's tight, handles beautiful. Good. I mean, the technology nowadays, uh, it's nothing to turn your nose up to, but for 1970 technology, I think you got something going on here with Ford. So, and, and you guys here at Legendary did a great job at restoring this vehicle back to its original. Um, like new, huh? It's just beautiful, it's just beautiful. Interior, exterior, underneath, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a hats off uh, restoration. It really is, great project. Thanks. Great project.